And uh, he was telling me about some of his experiences. I don't talk too much about some of my own because you see what happens to me, I break down too, I easy, would. too easily. So I don't talk too much about myself. I talk about, I talk about the fellows I know and the fellows I knew and some of the things that happened to them. Well, we are very Although lucky I to have you. Although I try not to remember a lot of them's name because I just didn't want to know who they were. I didn't want to know where they came from or anything. One of my favorite lieutenants, two of my favorite lieutenants. One was uh, a young man that had been a technical sergeant, was given a battlefield commission, was killed the next day. Uh, I did know his name, I can't even think of it right now, what his name is. Another lieutenant, first lieutenant, I lost track of him altogether. I, I, I thought I remembered him seeing, talking with him after the war ended, but I don't, I, I wasn't able to get in contact with him because he was from Ohio also and I wasn't able to get in touch with him at all, so. Well, it's quite the I responsibility. Kind of all together. Yeah. And um, in your experiences um, in Italy, when you found out that it was the end of the war, did things seem different to you? Did you just come right back home, or did they keep you in Italy? Well, uh, it seemed like to me, uh, you had to have so many points. There was a point thing that they did. I don't remember exactly how many points it was involved, but I had enough points. I had two. I had two battle stars. Um, and that's about the only thing I can remember. So I don't know what other awards I had. I never received the medals that I was entitled to. I was wounded. Tell me about that. that. I never received. The Purple Heart? Did they didn't fill out your paperwork? I never received the Purple Heart. Tell me about the, um, the what road. happened? It was a night bombing. And we were out. Uh, my little guide was with me, so he showed me where to go to get away from the bombing, but it was too late. He's shrapnel I got in my side. He went to the first aid station and got a aid to come and take care of me. The aide told me he, he did what he could do. And the aide told me to go to the first aid station the next morning. And maybe if I went to, the, I'd go to the hospital or something, I'd get a purple, purple heart. I think he probably told me that. But at that time, I. Medals didn't mean anything to me. I wasn't interested in medals. I was interested in getting the war over to come home. And uh, I never went to the first aid station. I, that may have had something to do with me not getting a Purple Heart, I don't know. But I know of one other, an officer, by the way, uh, uh, Captain <laughs> Fletcher. Coward. Same thing happened to him that happened to me. He didn't get a purple heart either. 
And of course, that goes for um, you, you soldiers. You get so many points if, we're, if, we're, if you were wounded, you know. But I had enough points anyway to come home uh, when the war ended without the Purple Heart. So it didn't make that much difference to me. And I don't know whether he did, I don't think he did have enough points to come home. Uh, he, he had to stay there. But uh, your yeah. young guide had actually run to your aid. He had run to my aid and uh, I would probably, uh, he probably would have saved my life. But I showed him where to go, where to and stay until I uh, was able <coughs> able to get an American first aid man to come and take care of me. So, no um, flesh wounds, most of them. It's combat wounds, so. Yeah, they're combat wounds. Yeah, exactly. The same thing. Right, you don't get that from going to work in That's Washington, right. D.C., so. When yeah. you came back to the States, did you want to stay in the service? When I first came back to the States, I thought about staying in the service because they told me I could join the reserves. And I thought about it and they said if anything happened that I'd have to come back into service, that I wouldn't have to worry about my rank or anything. I'd have the same rank I had when I was discharged. So I said, no, I guess I don't, uh, I better not uh, sign for that. And I said, you're, you're doing all this stuff too quickly to try to keep uh, some people in the service, you know. So I wouldn't sign up. But, but it did happen, by the way, that somebody signed up my name, my rank, my serial number, and even attended uh, reserve training and was paid, so I was told, uh, Master Sergeant's pay for being in the reserves, and I got credit for, I think, about four or five more years. It was identity for being in the theft? Service. You know they call it identity theft right yeah. now? Yes, that's what it amounted to. It must, that was, uh, they never did tell me exactly who it was or how it happened or anything like that, but they did allow me to be discharged. What happened was I was, Pulled back in the service for what was that, the Korean War? The Korean War that happened soon after World War II was over. And they sent me to the Pentagon because I insisted that I should I wasn't in, shouldn't be in the reserves. I wasn't in the reserves. I hadn't signed. And they were in the I had gotten in touch with my congressman who were uh, Mr. Bricker and Mr. Taft, and who had a lot of power, by the way, uh, as senators from the state of Ohio. And I had my relatives to write, uh, to keep writing, to let them know that I, I deserved, did not deserve to be in the service. Uh, when you went to Korea, what unit were you in? So they, Put me in a quartermaster, quartermaster. I thought it was a quartermaster company. When I got there, it was ten master sergeants in the quartermaster company. So I asked the uh, commander what I was supposed to do. He said, "Don't worry about it." So I knew then I was going to be a replacement when I got overseas. So when we got to Seattle, port of debarkation, the uh, my congressman, Brecker, and staff stopped me. I had sent word that there was an investigation going on about my activities and so on and so forth, and I would not be sent anywhere from there. So they put me in a MP detachment temporarily to ride the train back and forth uh, pick up the AWL soldiers and so on and so forth for about six or eight months, I guess it was. And I stayed in that until they finally decided, well, they 
brought me back here to Washington to go to the Pentagon as part of the investigation to talk to some officers at the Pentagon. And I mentioned to the officer at the Pentagon <coughs> that uh, I hadn't been on vacation or anything at my job and they could find out if I went on the reserve training program by going to my job and finding out how, how many times I'd been off of my job. Well, I, don't, I guess they did that, but they didn't tell me. Uh, and I asked him if I could, it was Christmas time, by the way, and I asked him if I could stay for Christmas. <laughs> if I could stay two or three days for Christmas. And because I was so biggity, I, he said no. <laughs> You gotta go back. So I said, okay. So I got the train to go back. <laughs> and I pretended to be sick. <laughs> they put me off in Chicago. <laughs> they took me off the train in Chicago and sent me to the Navy base there, wherever that was, some Navy base or something, hospital. <laughs> and I stayed there about three or four days. <laughs> And they had to give me new orders from there to get the rep back to Seattle. <laughs> I had two aunts that lived in Chicago. <laughs> and that was the reason why I said, I'll fix their business. I said, I'll get sick and I'll stay here for two or three weeks a week if they let me. <laughs> but anyway, I got to stay there at least three or four days. And, uh, I met Joe Lewis's wife, by the way, there, and I had met Joe Lewis before at Fort McClellan. So uh, uh, I had a nice time while I was in Chicago. Merry Christmas. <laughs> well, you were um, you uh, lived around and watched in this uh, last century when the world changed from segregated service, like um, how you served, to um, integrated military service right. as well, and integrated um, other sorts of facilities. So did you have, um, when you were coming back from World War II, did you have ideas that things should be integrated, things should be equal? Was this part of your Mr. Bigotty, you know, um, where you? Yeah. I had no idea that we were treated as bad as we, as bad as we were. I had no idea that, uh, I felt all the way all the time during my service. All I wanted to do was get back home. And uh, I thought that uh, it was a strange thing to me that uh, I had white friends, I had a white girlfriend at one time. And uh, I thought it was strange to me that we were being treated uh, so much different I saw troops being sent <coughs> to the line with no ammunition. Black troops, I saw as being a top sergeant in the replacement company, I saw some of the equipment we had was used equipment by somebody else. I saw uh, I mentioned to you, I saw the officers, white officers being sent down to the line and being brought back and being promoted faster than black officers. I never saw a black officer ever being promoted above the rank of captain. These things bothered me a lot when I came home. And I thought maybe the GI Bill would help me to uh, gain knowledge, more knowledge about what was going on in the world. That was the reason why I wanted to go to college under the GI Bill. So I was able to get a job with the Veterans Administration after the war. And uh, one of my white friends, in Marietta told me that uh, if I wanted to be promoted, oh, I got a government job, by the way. 
and uh, right there in Marietta in the Veterans Administration, I think it was part of the Veterans Administration, and one of my friends that worked there told me, uh, Ralph Weber, I can tell you what his name was even, because his dad was good friends with my dad, for one thing, and uh, before the war, and before my dad died. And he told me, he said, you know, Albert, he said, let me tell you something, he said, if you want to move, and get promoted or anything. He said, you don't want to stay here. He said, this is a small office. He said, there's only about a half a dozen of us. He said, and being colored, he said, they're not going to promote you to anything worthwhile. As for transfer to Washington, D.C., Columbus, or Cincinnati, or someplace like that, I said, oh, you yeah. know, so they put me in front of, you know, uh, promotion uh, for a job in Washington, D.C., and I said, I'll go to Howard University while I'm there. Sure enough, my transfer went through, and that's how I got to Washington, D.C., and started to uh, go to Howard University. In fact, I stayed at the Howard University dormitory because I came here to go to Howard University, and Howard couldn't take me, so they told me to go to American University, and that's where I went. But I stayed at the in the Howard dormitory because they had already paid them for me and everything. I was paying my rent, so they didn't even. I guess they didn't even know the difference, and they never asked me, so I never told them. You know, so I stayed there until I I got married, and my wife uh, said she got tired of me always going to school or working, going to school or working, going to school or working. Quit, she said. So I did start getting promotions, by the way, and uh, she, I decided I better come out. I didn't want to lose my wife. By the way, I, I, this story is a true story also. I asked my wife to marry me the first day I saw her and didn't know her name. And she said no, of course. Uh, but six months later, we were married. And we lived together for 61.